clear my role is really to be this kind of pivot point uh, between Eric and I think we're starting to sort of blur the lines here between both past and, and future. Um, and what I'd like to do is sort of focus on this question of change and what does, what does change mean and how change is reflecting the city today. Um, there we go. Um, and you know, how the city reflects both uh, the, the sort of underlying potential, as Eric put it, uh, of the ecological, uh, you know, the, the biogeography uh, that underlies the city, but also um, the shape of human decisions. Um, and of course, you know, the city, uh, as it's shown today, it's not, uh, it's not something that's static, of course. You know, it, it's, again, this sort of uh, snapshot that reflects this adaptive uh, quality that we and nature have. Um, that it's not some embodiment of perfection, uh, but rather a collection of decisions um, that that reflects our you know, which, which is, is nothing nothing else except a, uh, this diversity of decision making. Um, and so we see this uh, sort of manifested in uh, the city that we see in front of us. That uh, the landscape, the cityscape, has changed because of decisions, decisions about uh, and, and technolo technological changes um, that. Take, uh, for example, sort of our relationship to the harbor, uh, sort of a oyster barge uh, down in the East River um, uh, being changed into sort of a waterfront esplanade for recreation. Um, and these things are here in front of us every day, and sometimes we don't think about uh, why that, how that change happens. Um, you know, Eric talked a lot about ecological succession, and I'm very grateful to him for uh, allowing me not to have to explain it in front of a real college. Um, but uh, the thing I want to focus on is the disturbance uh, aspect of this. Because we all know that that progression, to, uh, that successional progression, uh, very often you don't get to uh, the, the sort of the, the potential. Uh, that in fact, um, disturbances, whether it's a hurricane or a wind throw, uh, or a man-made or human-made disturbance, uh, definitely changes that. And in fact, um, it's an ecological sort of uh, concept that I think is is all the more important today in this era of climate change. So, you know, as a planner, uh, of course, you know, that sort of change, that ecological succession is not a perfect model, of course, but we can think about sort of that succession of, of visions, you know, Ebenezer Howard's uh, vision of sort of garden cities as being the perfect blend of, uh, that, that would meet the needs of, of both, uh, or meet the challenges of rural abandonment and congested cities that we would have this kind of uh, garden city where all good things would happen. Um, you know, through planning, through infrastructure, through technological innovations, um, you know, and through you know, decisions made by organizations like the Regional Plan Association, you know, uh, uh, in the first regional plan, um, you know, became uh, you know Levittown and a change that we did continues to. Uh, a change that continues to happen and in fact then causes additional uh, challenges, you know, whether it's congestion on the highways, whether it's the fragmentation of landscape, whether it's uh, non-point source pollution into uh, underground aquifers. Um, again, sort of making that sort of that transformation, that crisis uh, that Bill talked about, uh, all, all the more real for present day planners. You know, another uh, sort of example like New York City's waterfront where uh, New York grew up uh, with, uh, as a port city and very quickly over, you know, relatively speaking, over several hundred years, built this enormous infrastructure uh, of ports and wharves and warehouses um, all along and, and uh, birthing uh, facilities all along the harbor, uh, changing that shoreline that we saw so dramatically in, in Eric's presentation. Um, and again, you know, something that changed, even as this is a great, one of the great things about working at RPA is that we'll like stumble across uh, these images. This is the uh, layout for Brooklyn Queens, what became the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Uh, something that again changed the, this uh, shot of Brooklyn uh, in the future. And of course, for the waterfront, the big dramatic moment was the advent of containerization. And uh, the fact that this new technolo technology, uh, this new infrastructure, uh, sort of really sort of hit about uh, 50 years ago, really marked uh, the advent of the decline of commercial piers and port facilities around the harbor and the subsequent uh, abandonment of much of that infrastructure in the water. Um, and that coupled with uh, water, water quality improvements, uh, this image from the Hudson River Foundation, uh, dramatically shows
shows how water quality became clean, has become cleaner again thanks to investments in, in water treatment. Um, and that combined with uh, sort of the availability of underutilized property has led to, in, in our, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, uh, the development of vast new neighborhoods around the city, Riverside South, uh, along uh, the Hudson River. Um, and you can see those uh, the abandoned piers there in the uh, you know, bottom right of the slide. Um, as well as changes that continue to occur uh, and, and change our image of the waterfront and its utility. Uh, some for better, maybe some not so much for better. Um, so why is that important? Of course, change is something that's uh, always been with us and always will be with us. But, um, you know, we know that with climate change, maybe we could also stretch that uh, uh, analogy a little bit further in terms of technological innovations, in terms of globalization of trade and economic uh, systems, uh, that we know that our normal uh, is no longer going to be normal. Uh, that, in fact, uh, the variability of systems, in particular the hydrologic system, uh, is going to shift dramatically uh, over the next, uh, we've already seen uh, these impacts, and we're going to see even more over the coming century, both with more frequent droughts, uh, more frequent and intense storms, that we can no longer think of sort of that normal range of variability in terms of climate as being what's normal. We need to be thinking about, again, sort of thinking about disturbance uh, as an ever, ever more present factor uh, in, our, in our planet. And uh, we know, and again, it's not a perfect uh, metaphor, but we know that landscape ecosystems uh, and, and I'm sorry, ecosystems in general, um, you know, when you have greater amounts of disturbance, uh, it tends to favor species that are more generalists, that have less, um, less intensive um, uh, biological requirements, that are more quickly adaptable, whether it's over time because of shorter reproductive cycles, uh, or because of their ability to um, perhaps uh, use a wider range of food sources. Um, and so, you know, perhaps we need to be thinking along those terms. Uh, again, not, not, uh, not suggesting we have, you know, more frequent reproductive cycles, perhaps, um, but uh, maybe what we need to be thinking about is our technological innovation, our infrastructure, our relationship to, let's say, the waterfront and the harbor as being something that's more adaptive, that's more in a word that'll come up uh, quite frequently, I'm sure, more resilient um, in terms of its ability to manage, to cope with uh, a greater range of variability. Um, and uh, one thing I've been very fortunate in this uh, water centennial year to be working with the Dutch consulate and a bunch of folks on the uh, forum uh, at the Dutch Place of the Science Center uh, last September. And one of the concepts I took away from that experience was really this idea of living with water. That in fact, um, you know, um, uh, the idea that water uh, is something that's part and not a waste product and we want to get rid of right away, not something to be shut out and put up, put in, uh, kept away from the city of barriers. It's actually something to be embraced and revealed uh, through our physical planning. And sort of changing that dynamic uh, and thinking uh, again to the kind of uh, wetland systems that once should the floods in the harbor, uh, both in terms of the uh, uh, the tidal flats, uh, the marshlands, uh, the stream corridors uh, that once surrounded us, uh, and how to embody those systems uh, in dealing with this issue of coastal, ever more frequent coastal flooding uh, that we're really going to come in on. Um, and so, you know, one possible solution is really this idea of introducing water into the landscape. Uh, this is an image from uh, uh, one of the charrette, the workshop charrettes at the September conference, the idea of sort of bringing water into the city. Again, we can't recreate the weapons uh, all around the city that we once had. We can certainly, uh, as Dave Berg alluded to, maybe try to protect the ones that are still here. Uh, but we can also start to reintroduce that kind of hydrologic regime in our thinking about our coastal zone. Um, we can be thinking about restoring oysters uh, that once anchored uh, the wetlands uh, and the rest of the coastal habitat. Uh, and also provide that sort of connection that we once had to the ecological systems in the harbor. Um, you know, we can think about uh, not using uh, infrastructure like Canada Basin, uh, combined sewer overflow facility in Queens, that does a great job of storing uh, storm 